in the wake of its inception in the late 50s and heyday in the early through mid 60s, over the two decades it spent far from the mainstream, surf as a genre stayed mostly niche, evolved slowly and consistently, the handfuls of bands pushing it further usually breaking off, going on to weave surf influence into what became totally new genres. That long-running pattern of slow evolution ended in the late 70s, when surf as a genre met the punk scene. In the late 80s and through the 90s, surf resurged with new bands across multiple scenes and subcultures. While the following bands could be called one of a dozen different subgenres scattered across numerous countries. For retrospective sake, it's much more comprehensive to view them as parts of a larger whole, each contributing to the surf resurgence in their own individual ways. For the first time since its inception, enough different voices started putting out material and getting recognized for it that the generation was able to define itself by similarities, and it became a new wave of surf, be it instrumental surf, surf punk, or any number of smaller genres alongside them. Along with Dead Kennedys, one of the first massive shakeups to surf since its inception hit November 1981, with Living in Darkness, the debut full-length and second release by Agent Orange from Southern California. Across eight brisk tracks on the original pressing, totaling about 20 minutes, the record takes off with a sharp, sinister, deadly serious atmosphere while unapologetically embracing its instrumental surf roots. Original tracks are punctured by covers of a couple instrumental surf classics, and the covers are charged with Agent Orange's fresh, dark sound just as much as the their original songs are charged with loyalty to classic surf composition. Darkness has heavy messages and atmosphere to convey, and the entire sound is dedicated to its serious tone. In that way, Agent Orange breaks from the mold that prior acts established, avoiding any satire or snideness. The music is sinister, heavy, and ferocious surf. Instead of crossing into other genres or evoking new manic energy, Darkness wants to be the fiercest and darkest instrumental surf record, wants its instrumental surf to be punk. There's a common sentiment that Darkness was the first surf punk album and it mostly comes to that. Agent Orange declared, instrumental surf can be punk, that's that, and the defiant ambiguity between those genre lines would become a defining feature of the next decade of newcomers. With surf's introduction into punk, its earliest effects came through varying influence in the wider punk scene, establishing some of its components as part of punk's compositional vocabulary, partly due to an appeal from that juxtaposition okay. culture's view of surf against the perception of punk, partly due to surf's long status of being a genre anyone can pick up and try playing, in a garage with little to no experience, surf-inspired melodies, hooks, and riffs, and bass stylings found themselves mixed into the punk lexicon. On the more subtle end, bands from the early and late 80s drew from surf, as well as blues, 50s, and 60s pop rock, and plenty of other genres, while on the more obvious end, other bands embraced mixing surf with their flavor of punk to try out their take on surf punk, and this would swell in the early 90s, with a group of bands that took that influence further while remaining their own force. Punk, garage, and DIY in general saw massive influence from a wave of bands breaking into a level of prominence still obscure to the general public, but hugely influential in their own scenes. Taking from 60s proto-punk and garage, 50s and 60s pop, surf and instrumental surf, and anything that could make grungier and grittier. Dozens of acts set out to make the dirtiest noise they could, with bombastic energy and a gnarled pop core. A filthy twist on 50s and 60s rock and culture. In the 50s, rock was largely scandalous. Rock and roll has got to go. And go it does at KWK. We're all through playing rock and roll records. This week is record-breaking week here at KWK. And after this week, no more rock and roll will be played on the air. I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. I 100% believe it. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. I know the, the, the lost position that you get into in the beat. Well, uh, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what it is about rock and roll music that they like, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat. But was quickly reincorporated to the mainstream, and more than anything, this wave of acts could be seen as a reclamation of the messiest and dirtiest of that old music, a rediscovering of what made it good and leaving behind what made it bad, and pushing it forward to synergize with the increasing intensity of the then-contemporary counterculture. 
Not far into that wave, the 50 sounds were met with 50s aesthetics, gravitating to retro horror than sci-fi. Wearing cheesy costumes became part of the aesthetic, complementing the absolute chaos of their shows, and the frequent violence among their audience, sometimes from band members. Frequent clips and sampling from old horror and reckless blending of genres defined this exploitation-loving era of rock by that energy and aesthetic more than by specific musical lineage. These bands were defined by their attitude and their look, and for that they are typically considered a genre of their own, or a splinter wave of garage rock, defined by the methods they took to try to grow garage rock or DIY rock in general in their era with these tactics. But thanks to what else had been going on in overlapping subcultures, all of this chaos would mix and build to something drastically different. In the first years of the 90s, a new wave of artists released their first full lengths in EPs, and in contrast to what most scenes had been doing since Agent Orange, this handful was out to bring instrumental surf back, to renew the long-standing composition style, with newer counterculture aesthetics that had exploded slightly before and around them. While they all came from different scenes and backgrounds, they were united by a common love for classic surf composition. While they formed in Tokyo in 1986, the five, six, seven, eights wouldn't see any releases beyond singles and compilation cassettes until 1981, and in 1982 they became a trio rather than the original quartet and would catch international attention that would slowly build through the rest of the 90s into the early 2000s. Musically, the 5678s draw from vocal and instrumental surf pretty regularly, any given song equally likely to be a sharp, frenzied instrumental track. <laughs> a poppy but no less wired track. While not far removed from classic surf bands compositionally, the band hit hard with garage and DIY circles. For their boundless energy, their rough and dirty sound shaped around poppy hooks, and vocalist Yoshiko's ability to snarl and scream. With art and aesthetics either evoking 60s nostalgia with dashes of filth, or the direct exploitation cheese of the primarily American movement mentioned prior, the 5678s set themselves apart from the plethora of other acts by always staying loyal and true to their surf sound, fundamentally. Even if their style as a band was contemporary, their sound's core continued where the earliest surf punk bands left off, channeling a very loyal rendition and interpretation of early instrumental surf and channeling it into their own brand and flavor of ferocity. <laughs> In the American punk scene, San Francisco's The Trash Women would debut in 92 with a lusty EP, introducing their take on harder, more frenzied instrumental surf. Yeah. 
Beyond being an incredibly solid instrumental surf act, the Trash Woman's low production value and high sleaze persona, their association to prior punk acts in the region, and all femme lineup sparked considerable interest in the region, which caught on to the greater DIY crowd. That aesthetic was highly compatible, and their fierce instrumental performances built onto a desire to explore the often overlooked surf genre. The Trash Woman would put out new releases several times a year from 92 to 96, retiring in 97 apart from a few reunions. Over their tenure, they pushed the sound to the messiest, grimiest sonics they could, all while trying to preserve the traditional core of the music, crossing exploitation and instrumental surf more totally than any of their contemporaries. Also in San Francisco, but a couple years earlier, the Mermen had made their debut in the local psychedelic rock scene. It would take them five years to follow up their first record, and in that time, that record would catch attention from outside their niche and hook the growing audience looking for more instrumental surf. While homaging or drawing on surf was almost as common in psychedelic as it was in garage rock in that era of punk, Mermen made the leap by essentially being an instrumental surf band of particularly skilled musicians, drawing on psychedelic and experimental rock to deepen the fundamental take on instrumental surf, reinvigorating that sound with new intrigue and mystique while keeping the old core intact. Their second release from 94 took that sound harder, faster places, and nearly yearly releases through to the end of the decade would cement Merman as a band equally interested in being heavy and hard as it was with being thoughtful and deliberate, a band of very intentional and nuanced musicians pursuing something as hard and intricate as they could while maintaining loyalty to the sound they wanted to recreate all while leaving room for decompression and occasionally exploring more relaxed sounds, almost more in line with the vibe of Hawaiian rock. Similarly, in Alberta, Canada, a punk band called Crash Kills 5 briefly existed in the early 80s, releasing a single EP before splitting up, only to reform in 84 with greater ambitions, as shadowy men on a shadowy planet. They would release EPs and singles throughout the late 80s, remaining mostly local and unknown until their 1991 debut full-length. While Crash Kills 5 was mostly a Ramones clone, shadowy men on a shadowy planet blended a light prog and art rock with a strong instrumental surf core, closer to 50-50 than the Merman had, creating an incredibly clean, polished, and often relaxed, but nonetheless intricate and ambitious sound, fond of repetitious short tracks, but dedicated to using those short tracks to shape a couple albums much greater than the sum of their parts. Generally, the appeal of shadowy men dug into prog and art rock fans, the band themselves releasing tracks declaring their disinterest in being tied to or limited to surf rock, seemingly wanting to draw on that core but not seeing it as something that they could forever explore, instead of seeing it as something they needed to grow from. Though throughout their existence within that decade, sharper moments threw more fuel onto a building fire, the existence of this band and all the others evoking a single question. If surf can expand to be this, what else can it expand to? What is surf really capable of. Isolated in Finland, never as popular as previously mentioned bands, but just as influential on the musicians who did hear them, Lykia and the Cosmonauts released their first album in 1988 and their most famous in 1990, Ratalanka. I know I'm not saying that right, I can't roll my R's, I have a speech impediment, that's the best I'm gonna do, is a Finnish word that generally refers to instrumental rock, particularly with electric guitar, but which, in the right context, also evokes some sounds we're familiar with. Rapid tremolo picking, fast tempo, clean sharp production, a twingy and slightly echoey guitar, thriving on minor chords and dark melancholy. Ratalanka can be seen as the Finnish answer to American instrumental surf rock, instrumental rock in general, hot rod rock, created in the 60s and shaped by the mix of those musicians' innovation, incorporated with elements of traditional Finnish folk music and Finnish culture, creating something similar but distinct, if more culturally and thematically distinct than compositionally. The genre had its heyday in the 60s with Finnish youth culture, but crashed when prog rock caught on, like Surfhead, retreating to small counterculture niches for the next few decades of its history. Mm -hmm. 
Laika and the cosmonauts combined the gloominess and minor chord melodic habits of Ratalanka with the greater rhythmic presence and potential for chaos and thrill presented by instrumental surf, and their boundless energy, pursuit of intensity and thrill, and habit to balance that with slower, psychedelic-esque atmospheric tracks, created an at times self-contradictory but instrumentally charged sound, largely isolated from the American movement, but hidden interestingly similar areas of heaviness, hardness, mystery, and intrigue is that American counterpart within an instrumental surf or surf Ratalanka combined framework. Laika and the Cosmonauts could be argued to be the darkest sounding and one of the most musically varied and intricate surf bands the scene had yet seen, and three years after their most iconic release, another band would take that energy further. <laughs> Astro Man arrived in 1992 in Alabama with a debut EP and are probably the most influential and famous instrumental surf band formed after 1965. They initially caught on with underground scenes for explosive live shows, as chaotic or even more so as their contemporary garage bands, and the musicianship's endless energy and their thrilling performances carried them further. They quickly caught on in even wider circles due both to the consistency of their persona and the quality of their composition. As their name suggests, Man or Astro Man embrace 50s cheese at every opportunity. Their early albums, including distorted sampling from 50s movies, TV, and even technological maintenance and repair resources. Drum beat test for stereo spread. along with incredibly consistent album theming and live costumes, to paint their music as an export from a fantastical but familiar interstellar future. While many garage bands pulled from that era's iconography, Man or Astro Man wove it to the core of the music itself. Songs about giant monsters, visitors from strange craft, interstellar food regulation, and music evoking the experience of traveling time vortexes and black holes paint their releases as works of science fiction and slices from that fantastical world. Their albums as much concept albums as they are instrumental surf records. Compositionally, framing devices and personas set aside, Man or Astro Man still proved themselves unique, and it's tempting to let this become a discography deep dive, but I'll keep it brief. The first two releases are strictly loyal to the best of classic instrumental surf, both running 45 minutes, but one totaling 16 songs and the other 21. The band packed as much speed, intensity, and instrumental impact as they could while keeping their loyalty to older material preserved. As soon as the third release, and especially the fourth, the 
the conceptual side of the band would grow, and familiar surf song structures started being replaced or expanded on with more experimental composition, applying familiar and skillful surf, along with sci-fi sounds and harder, punkier instrumentation, to transition the band from a loyal classic instrumental surf act to something exploring its own sound as deeply as it could. Man or Astro Man's first four releases stand as both some of the most intensely played classic instrumental surf and some of the most interestingly punky or DIY experimentation into that sound. Even if sonically they were never as gritty as other acts, their combination of darkness and mystique from those darker acts, embellished with sci-fi, tied together with expertly played instrumental surf, even more loyal than most, created something familiar but totally shocking. It accomplished what surf had long been building to. Early Man or Astro Man embodied most of what made surf great and utilized it in a way that made decades old genre feel excitingly new. It's Venus. Huh? Venus. Why not? We bounced signals off the moon's surface. There's no reason that Venus shouldn't radiate impulses. I don't mean the static. Can't you hear it? The other thing? What other thing? Listen to it, Paul. Listen to the voice. <laughs> Through the mid to late 90s, Leica and the Cosmonauts and Man or Astro Man delved deeper into experimentation, Leica exploring more electronic and almost new wave approaches to a sharp, clean, familiar melodic sound, and Man or Astro Man pushing their experimentation as far as they could, introducing obscure instruments like theremins, more electronic sounds and sampling, and moving past their more melodic roots to something closer to art rock, always as ferocious and driven in their musicianship as they were when they began, but drifting further from anything conventional and deeper into reinvention. Until 2001, when feeling they explored everything and feeling a little burned out, they retired. Though in the 2010s, they returned for a new album and still sometimes play live shows on the East Coast to today. They also wrote background music and the end theme for Space Coast Coast to Coast and wrote the Jimmy Neutron theme song, among other things. While their entire catalogs had interesting, enthralling music to offer, the impacts these two bands made on their scenes came mostly from their mid-90s work. And a few years after that influential era, overlapping with the experimental albums they moved on to, a wave of new acts began, the kind of wave that hadn't been seen since the 60s. Between 1997 and 2001, in the wake of that surge of influential bands over the last decade, dozens of new surf acts made their first releases, generally associated with one of three semi-movements. Roughly before the other two, several bands highly influenced by early revival acts, particularly Man or Astro Man, especially in Space Age aesthetics and Persona, took to their own interpretations of that style of mysterious instrumental sci-fi surf, most metasonic middle ground between the Space Age and the traditional, landing somewhere sonically similar to the earliest Man or Astro Man, some of these bands then going harder, some more melodic, some more atmospheric, each act mixing influences to reach their preferred take on the sound. Out of dozens, the Troublemakers, the Space Cassocks, and the Amino Acids were a few to reach modest popularity, bordering on mainstream success but never quite making the bold splash that the bands that directly inspired them managed to. While they weren't a far departure, the evolution made by that group and their inspiration was controversial to some, and in response, a more traditionalist subsection formed and grew in popularity, seeking to capture classic instrumental surf, sometimes harder or more DIY, but never stretching song structure or genre nearly as loosely as previous bands did, although it's worth considering that their loyalty was based on a sound many didn't have easy access to, since a lot of old surf was hard to come by at the time, perception of what was loyal and traditional wasn't always accurate and could sometimes depart more than the subsection they were rejecting did, a consequence of seeking to replicate an almost 40-year-old sound before the internet made it easy to pull up long, neglected instrumental surf classics. And out of dozens or possibly hundreds of acts, Jetpack, The Kilauea's, Blue Stingrays, and a band whose name I'm not sure I can say out loud without YouTube getting upset with me, rose to decent popularity, some regarded by certain fans as the greatest surf bands since the 60s, and by a few niches as the only surf bands after the 60s or 70s, the experimentation over the last decade or two, making those other bands something else entirely. 
Slightly after that subset was carved, a few other bands sought out a common ground between innovative mid-90s surf and the surfy garage rock that helped launch it, returning to the very start of the surf resurgence. Or even further, they incorporated frequent vocal parts, poppier melodies, and filthy audio and lyrics, though at the same time kept more true and consistent with surf theming, creating a range of bands who could, sometimes on the same record, strongly emulate 80s DIY, then trailblaze with a thrilling new interpretation of instrumental surf, rivaling the mid-90s bands. These bands were more willing to cross into pop and pop-punk, skate and melodic hardcore influences finding their way alongside instrumental surf, but usually taking a backseat to the instrumental surf focus. Notable examples including The Spits, The Scaries, and Messer Chups. This category is by far the messiest, since throughout the 90s, mostly isolated from the evolution happening in instrumental surf, varying levels of surf influence were carried through pop-punk by pop-punk bands, and whether these new acts were influenced by pop-punk bands, or by instrumental surf resurgence, or by both in varying ways, is hard to determine. A lot like the difficulty in determining Ramon's influence versus surf influence in the mid and late 70s. Along with the new surge of bands, Revival Surf and Surf in general returned to the media, more in demand and focused on than it had been since the 60s. Resurgence bands began appearing in commercials, movies, TV shows, with theme songs and background music. and stock music companies and small-time acts and composers filled media, especially targeted to tweens and teens, with instrumental surf and, at least in the eyes of a few kids and a few marketing companies, surf was as extreme and cool as alt-rock a few years prior. At least on some level, surf iconography, or at least perceived surf iconography, found its way back in pop culture as something cool counterculture kids were into. Surf tracks were in skateboard games alongside punk and garage rock. <laughs> from the mid-90s to early 2000s, if you asked the average person to imagine what a surf band was, they might not have immediately pictured the Beach Boys, but instead Dick Dale, something from the 60s, a general, harder surf sound made by the collective of the resurgence, or maybe even something that sounded like the 5678s, or Man or Astro Man. Few specific bands received the honor of mainstream celebration, and as quickly as the mainstream remembered surf, its attention was caught by other upcoming genres, and by the mid-2000s, the surf had dropped back into a obscurity, though this time its niche wasn't limited to California or Australian beaches. The resurgence, for its five-ish years it existed in full force, had involvement from bands across the world, and when surf left the mainstream again, there were more niche scenes, local venues, and small labels ready to catch the genre and keep it alive than surf had ever had before. And in a way, even though bands generally stopped gaining widespread attention outside of surf fan circles, the output of new bands never really slowed down, and the surf resurgence, in a way technically never ended. It just got comfortable with being one of the largest, most varied niche genres in existence. The surf resurgence spread the sound, and every scene and niche it stuck in, it endured, and surf was back to stay. Initiation into the fires of pagan sexuality began. In an era where sex outside of marriage was almost universally viewed as wrong, even sinful, Teenagers began to dance to the coded sensuality. Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. That's the best way I know to get rid of it.